be talking about next. Uh, it's an interesting little theorem. Uh, it says, the next theorem concerns a limit of a function that is squeezed between two other functions, each of which has the same limit at a given x value as shown in the two figures. So the important thing to know about the squeeze theorem is you really need to know this case right here, that uh, it basically needs to happen that your function that you are trying to find the limit of, which in this case is f of x, you need to know that f of x is always between two other functions, both of which you are able to calculate the limits for. So if we do not know how to calculate the limit of f of x at c, uh, what we need to do is find two functions, at h of x and g of x, uh, of which h of x is always below f of x, and g of x is always above f of x. And therefore, if we are able to find uh, a value, c, to where both h of x and g of x are approaching that same value, and f of x is, is squeezed in between them, then f of x will have to have the same given limits as the other two functions at that c value. So anyway, this is used a little bit to, to prove some theorems, and the reason this comes up is we're going to look at some special cases, uh, and the proofs for those a lot of those special cases can be used with the squeeze theorem. So here's another little example of the squeeze theorem, uh, or actually the theorem itself. So if uh, h of x is less than f of x, which is less than g of x for all x is an open interval containing c, uh, except possibly c itself, if the limit of h of x as x approaches c is l, and the limit of g of x uh, as x approaches c is also l, because f of x is in between those two things, then the limit of f of x as x approaches c exists and is also equal to l. Now, the important thing, uh, of course, about the squeeze theorem is its ability to help us prove others. And these three special cases are things that you need to be very, very aware of. They need to be things that you probably have to invest a little bit of time memorizing. It doesn't mean that you have to memorize them right off, but by the time you're taking your AP exam, they're pretty much must. So the limit of the sine of x over x as x approaches 0 is equivalent to 1. Uh, the limit of 1 minus the cosine of x over x as x approaches 0 is equal to 0. And the limit of 1 plus x raised to the 1 over x power as x approaches 0 is equivalent to e. Now, if you go back and you look, when you were first introduced to e, uh, that should be pretty similar to uh, how you were taught e, except it's probably uh, 1 plus 1 over n raised to the n power. And you're going to figure out that that theorem is going to work about the same thing. So anyway, you need to know these. You may not have to memorize them right off. Hopefully, by use, they'll just get ingrained in your head. But by the end of the, the course, you're going to need to know those for the AP exam. So here's an example. It says the limit of the tangent of x over x as x approaches 0. Now, uh, again, gosh, I'm going to tell you, uh, a lot of the, the special stuff we're going to have to do in this is more algebra than anything. So the manipulation of the problem. So the tangent of x over x, I don't really know what that limit is, but what I can do is rewrite it. So the tangent of x I know is sine of x over cosine of x and of course times 1 over x. Well now what we can do is we can use uh, some other little methods to help us simplify and just say okay well if you're multiplying fractions together uh, it doesn't really matter how you order the multiplication of the numerators and denominators so we can really write this as the sine of x over x times 1 over the cosine of x. Well now oh, we can actually take the limit of each of those independently. So we use direct substitution here uh, and unfortunately it does not work but that is one of our special cases, so uh, that is equivalent to 1. And then 1 over cosine of x, if you plug in 0, you can use direct substitution there. And uh, the cosine of 0 is 1, so therefore you're going to get 1 times 1 over 1, or 1 times 1, which will give us an answer of 1.